Happy Halloween, spookaroos! Or if you're listening to this a little bit after Halloween, which is probably more likely, I hope you had a good Halloween. And I hope I did too, because while I'm recording this, it's not quite Halloween yet. It is Halloween Eve. I'm recording this episode a little bit later than I normally would, just because life gets in the way, once again, as it so often does. Obviously, October is my busy season between the podcast and my day job and my other jobs, and of course, my witch finding in Salem, which keeps me quite busy on the weekends. So tonight, what we're going to do is I'm going to, as has become kind of a tradition, discuss what my Halloween season was like. And I invite you to tell me what your Halloween season was like through all of the social media, which I'll get to in just a minute. And we're also going to talk about uh, Ben Cooper, the iconic Halloween costume company. We're not going to do too much of a deep dive because I actually couldn't find a ton of information about the Ben Cooper company. What I did find comes mostly from Wikipedia and from... The website Thrillist, which I will post a link to uh, in my website and through social media, and you can read the full article there. But that's really all the information I was able to find. So I don't think it's quite enough to do a regular, you know, full episode about, but it's perfect to fit in here, right? Because we're going to be talking about Halloween, so why not end our conversation with a discussion of one of the most legendary Halloween costume creators of all time. Before we dive into our trick-or-treating goodness, I would like to point you to the show's webpage that is SpookyAssShit.com or SpookyAS.com. They both take you to the same place and that is the show's blog page. From there, you can check out each and every episode, even the ones no longer available on iTunes, and you can also find outtakes and YouTube videos and pictures to go along with most episodes. You can also find links to all of our social media. We are at Spooky Ass Shit on both Instagram and on Twitter. And you can find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Spooky AS. And of course, don't forget, if you're a true blue Spookaroo, you can join the diehard fans in the Spookaroo secret group. Why secret? So that the public doesn't know just how much of a little nasty freak that you are. But we don't judge. So if you want to come on and you want to talk about your love of some slasher movie and yet you don't want, you know, potential employers or clients or family to know just how obsessed you are with these kinds of things or true crime or something like that, this is a place where you can speak your mind and we are usually happy to hear what you have to say. Now, it is the end of the Halloween season, which is both good and bad because of course the most exciting part is Halloween day in a way and uh, sad of course because now the season is over and we're going to be consumed by Christmas now Christmas is a fine holiday I don't have a problem with it I enjoy Christmas I like spending time with my family and giving presents and whatnot but of course Halloween is our time really right so it's sad to see it go but I have to say I work extremely hard all through October. Uh, Not only am I the Witchfinder General of Salem, Massachusetts, each and every weekend from late September all the way through October, but also I plan the Halloween party at the day job. And that is a chore and a half each and every year. And I'm going to be honest with you folks, as soon as my nieces and nephews are not interested in trick-or-treating anymore... I'm probably going to start not going to work on Halloween because I'll go to Salem instead. The only reason I go to work is, well, you know, I'm going to go trick-or-treating with the kids uh, while they're still young enough to enjoy it. And since I'm going to do that, there's really no point in going to Salem to come back to go all the way out to where my sister lives. So once they're done trick-or-treating, I'm going to be done going to work and, uh, well, at that job anyway, and I'm going to be back on the streets of Salem celebrating Halloween in the one and only true Halloween capital of the world, Salem, Massachusetts. But I do bust my ass each and every October, and uh, quite literally, because, you know, it's not easy. As, as easy and effortless as I make it look, it's actually not easy to stand on a little box uh, six to eight hours 
per weekend day and talk all that time and and be hustling all that time and performing all that time. And by the end of the month, I am quite sore and quite tired all the time. In fact, I would rather be taking a nap right now, but such is my commitment to you that I am awake and recording this episode and making sure that I get it out before Halloween. Speaking of Salem, lots of cool stuff happened in Salem this year. Of course, the coolest thing that happened is that I got to meet one of you guys, a real spookaroo in person. Uh, that was Kanan. I already talked about that several episodes back. But um, Kanan, if you're listening, here's another shout out for you. How you doing? And another cool thing that happened is that I met some fellow podcasters. In fact, I met several. But there's uh, two that I'd like to mention specifically. Well, three, technically, because one of them is a twosome. So the first ones that I met were a couple of ladies named Olivia and Mackenzie, and they have a podcast. They're pretty new to the game, but they have a podcast called Death by Champagne, and it's all about spooky stuff, but it's kind of more my favorite murdery. It's two young ladies drinking champagne, hence the title, and talking about uh, you know, usually true crime, but sometimes spooky stuff. And uh, they were kind enough to give us a very nice shout out specifically about my witch finding, but also they did mention the podcast and that they've listened to a few episodes. Um, and, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, it was weird listening to a podcast and hearing people talk about me. Uh, I've done interviews and stuff like that, but you know, so that's kind of different. But it was weird, like, being a fly on the wall and hearing people talk about me but i certainly appreciate it and their words were very kind so if you could please show those ladies some love if you like this show chances are pretty good that you will like their show um as i said they are clearly heavenly <laughs> heavenly heavily inspired by uh my favorite murder they are not um afraid to admit that they are fans of that show it's all over their instagram and i think you'll be able to pick up that kind of flavor on their show and I also know that, uh, like myself, there's a lot of my favorite murder fans out there, murderinos, um, who also are spookaroos. So, uh, if you like that, you'll probably like this. So, again, the name of their show is Death by Champagne, and you can find them on Instagram at... Uh, now, this is where it gets a little tricky, because their Instagram is not the same as their show. Their Instagram is called Dead from Champs. So, dead... dead dead from champagne i guess but uh their show is death by champagne so it gets a little little tricky but it's like this show sometimes we're spooky as and sometimes we're spooky ass shit it depends which platform you're asking now the other one that i mentioned the other podcast that i mentioned running into this one i'm taking a bit of a gamble here uh this one is a podcast called iconography and it is Written and hosted by a man named Charles Gustine. Gustine? Gustine? I literally just listened to him say it, and I hope that one of those... It's not Gustine. I think it's Gustin. Uh, <laughs> but I was literally just listening to an episode of a show to hear him catch it. I am really bad with names. I'm sorry, Charles. Um, but the podcast is called Iconography. I have not listened to the episode that he interviewed me for yet. So I am hoping that he was kind... And I'm also hoping that he found a way to edit it in such a way that I sound halfway intelligent because I, as you know, love to talk and especially about the witch trials and especially about witch finding in Salem and all that stuff. You guys are well aware of that. Um, so I have not listened to it yet, but it is available on iTunes. He literally just emailed me and told me that the episode has gone up live. So it's available now. Um, you guys know me, so I guess it doesn't matter if you hear it. I'm just worried about people who don't know me, and they hear me trying to defend uh, the commercialism of Salem and all that, uh, and discussing it, and 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 really rambling. And so hopefully, hopefully Charles found a nice way to uh, make it sound like we had a a really decent conversation, which I think we did. It's just that I am very verbose, so uh, I'm sure that's added some uh, time to his editing the episode as well but go ahead and check them out and i will just say it is nice to be recognized as an icon and interviewed as such 
That was kind of a joke. I know that's not really what happened, but iconography, check it out. It's actually, um, I, you know, when he, when he, he met me on the street and did not announce that he was a podcaster or anything like that. Um, I took a picture with his wife with the guilty sign around her neck and all that, like my normal shtick. Um, they did not do a show that he actually did not get to see me do an actual trial, which of course is something else that I offer. And, uh, but the next day he had, he emailed me and said, would I be interested in talking about it? Uh, Salem and, and how it grapples with the history of the witch trials and, and how I'm, how I handle it and all that. Uh, and I said, yeah, sure. Of course. So, uh, then before I, well, actually before I agreed to be on the show, I listened to it. I listened to it, um, several episodes and, you know, I'm a history buff anyway, so uh, I really enjoyed it, and I bet that you guys will too. It's a little bit more sleek, a little bit more uh, professional in manner than this show, which is just, you know, recorded here. I'm actually recording it from my bed right now, sitting up, but still in bed, and uh, very casual on this show. So, uh, it, it's you know, his is a little bit more sleek and a little more professional, and uh, I think you guys there's a good chance that a lot of you would like it. So you should check it out anyway, whether I was on it or not, but go ahead and give my episode a listen. Let me know how you think I sound on it. All right. So those were some cool things that happened on the streets of Salem. Of course, there were many, many more interesting things that happened. Uh, two fights, um, people being douchebags um, and trying to literally come up behind and push me off my box. Luckily that only happened once, but with the broken ankle, I was very afraid of that happening um, and re-injuring my ankle and all that. Luckily I do actually have pretty good balance. So I did not fall off the box and, uh, just some, you know, creepy people doing creepy things. A woman taking my bell and ringing it loudly in my ear, sneaking up behind me and doing that. Uh, don't know why they thought that was such a good idea, but of course, nice things happen too. There was one day that was a little rainy and drizzly and a woman came over and offered to buy me a hot apple cider, which was very sweet. Um, interactions with little children are always nice. And, uh, just, you know, uh, hearing there was a woman who came this last weekend on Sunday and, uh, she heard my comments about the witch museums, which I do make a little comment on at the end of my show and, uh, not favorable comments necessarily. And she said, you know, I'm a, I'm a, she said she was getting her master's and is thinking about writing her thesis on the witch trials and all, and that she came to Salem in part to learn the history and everything, and that she had been to the witch museums, and she was very disappointed um, with what was presented there, and uh, really appreciated my efforts in the street, even just being a street guy, you know, as always, I try to get the real history out there, and I try to, even though I only do a short little show, you know, maybe five to ten minutes, I try to really load it with interesting facts, and I always make myself available after a trial to answer questions about Puritanism, about the witch trials, about Salem, about Halloween, whatever people want to talk about. I'm ready to talk about it at my own expense, actually, because, you know, in theory, I'm there working, right? But the working part is part of it. But what I really love is interacting with people and sharing my passions with people. And if you're a weird history slash spooky person like me, there's no better place in the world where those two things mingle together than Salem, Massachusetts. But what about the rest of my Halloween season? As you folks might recall, usually I go to some horror conventions around this time of year. There are three that I usually hit, at least two of. That would be Rock and Shock Convention in Worcester, Massachusetts, the Super Mega Fest Convention, which is not strictly a horror convention, and it used to be in November, and I'm actually really disappointed that it's in October now, because it conflicts with a lot of things. Um, but that's not strictly a horror convention. That moves around, but it's back in Framingham, Massachusetts now. And um, the Chiller Theater Convention, which is all the way in New Jersey. But they usually get some really good people. So at least one person that I'm really interested in. So I usually go out there. This year, none of those places had anybody that made me say, oh, I've got to go there. I've got to take some time off Salem and go to this convention. So I didn't do that. Also, when I go to Chiller, that's usually when I stop by Sleepy Hollow and uh and the the um castle from the halloween that almost wasn't uh lindhurst i was totally blanking on the name lindhurst in uh new york 
so it didn't make it out there this year. Um, but I did do some fun Halloweeny things starting at the very end of September. My niece's birthday is in September, and I am so proud to say that she is growing up to be quite a spooky little girl. Although what's funny is she doesn't like to be afraid. Like, you know, she likes scary movies, but they can't be too scary. She doesn't like to go to haunted houses. Um, so, you know, she's a spooky girl, but still a, a girl, like in the traditional sense, you know, a young girl. So, you know, take it for what it is. But I did ask her, I said, what do you want to do something for your birthday? What do you want to do? Um, last year we went to spooky world in New Hampshire and that turned out to be a little bit too much for her. So I said, well, you want to do this year? And she, she asked to go to the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast. Now I've been there several times. If you don't know, uh, it's a very famous case in Massachusetts, but I don't know how famous it is outside of Massachusetts. I don't know how much people pay attention to it. But um, Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. That's the rhyme. Um, Very little of that rhyme is true. It was not her mother. It was her stepmother. It was not 41 uh, or 40 wax. And basically everything about it is wrong. But uh, we'll, we'll go and visit that story on a different episode of this podcast but uh basically she did murder her well she was accused of murdering her stepmother and her father with a hatchet and it was a very brutal slaying and she was arrested for it and put on trial but she was acquitted not found innocent she was acquitted of the crime So uh, she lived the rest of her life in Fall River, Massachusetts, where the murders took place and was kind of a pariah socially. It's a very interesting story. But anyway, the house where the murders happened uh, is now open as the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast. And you can stay there. But also during the day, they give tours of the house. And it's a very interesting place to visit. They also have a gift shop, which is a little strange because it is, you know, a murder site, and they have, uh, for example, a hatchet dripping blood as a wind chime. The blood drops are the chimes of the thing, and uh, they didn't have them this time, but another time when I went, they had baby bibs that said, I love my mummy to death, and it had like a bloody heart and an axe and everything, and I was, you know, far be it for me to judge anybody's morality, but I do kind of cringe when I see that kind of thing. So. Yeah. But anyway, I did bring my niece. We went through the tour. It was not too scary for her. Um, And she says that she enjoyed it very much. We took some nice pictures there, including on the couch. It's not the actual couch, but the uh, couch where one of the bodies was discovered. Um, They Actually, one thing I will say, uh, there's a lot to like about the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast, but one of the things that's so cool is that they really do pay attention to detail and it looks very historically accurate like they have pictures that you can compare to uh you know the house as it stands today and you know it's not the couch but it looks just like it and even in the other rooms like the dressers and everything they look they're not none of it is the original furnishing but it looks just like it so it's uh it's a really cool place to visit and i definitely recommend it if you're in massachusetts i like it my niece likes it what more could you ask for Now, this past Saturday, the last Saturday in October, is normally the busiest day in Salem, and it's crazy, crazy, crazy. But we actually had a nor'easter this Saturday, and the original report that I had heard said the rain was going to end for the most part around 3 p.m. and that there would just be drizzle after that. So I said, you know, it's such a busy day. It's such a big day. I can't afford to miss it. If the storm breaks, so I'm going to go early like normal, get my good parking spot like normal. And uh, then if the storm breaks, I will do my act. And if not, then I'll just go home. And I was joined on this particular Saturday by a lovely young lady. And we went up to Salem and the weather was shitty. Nobody was hanging out outside. There was absolutely no point in my going there. But hey, I'm dedicated. I had to try. And then I said, well, since we're here, do you want to just do a couple touristy things that I haven't gotten around to yet? So we checked out some stores that I hadn't been to. One of them uh, being Emporium 32. Let me try that again. One of them being Emporium 32. Now, I've heard about this place because it's uh, right on, I think it's Central Street. 
but it's right off es- Essex Street, which is, you know, where I stand all day. Um, and I had heard about it because it's actually owned by a friend of semi-regular contributor to this show, Jenny Blades, who has not been on in quite a long time um, for her own personal reasons. Nothing, nothing bad. Don't worry. But she's very busy. And hopefully she will be back soon. I'm, I've sent her a text about once a month or so saying, hey, are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? Are you ready yet? And, uh, you know, hopefully soon. But anyway, I didn't go into the store because Jenny had said like, oh, you should check it out. My friend owns it. Uh, it's, it's a cool store. It's like steampunk stuff. And I hate steampunk. So I never checked it out. But I said, well, why don't we go in, you know? Um, and to my shock and amazement, it, although there are steampunky elements, I would not say that it's a steampunk store. It's definitely um, vintage inspired. Um, I would I would say kind of Victorian y overall, although they do have some more modern styles and, and things available, but they um, it's kind of an eclectic collection, but they have all, all kinds of things and it's uh it's actually quite a lovely little store so uh <laughs> i guess i i'm i guess i won't go through all the different kinds of things that they have but all, all kinds of stuff and uh you would probably like it there's probably a little bit of something for everyone in there so check out emporium 32 uh and the other place that i finally got to it's a relatively new spot in salem although not all that new now but it's called gallows hill theater I had heard good things about it, but I'd never been there myself. So on this day, me and my lovely date went to Gallows Hill Theater. And uh, what they do is kind of a very short stage show where they, you know, try to thrill you and chill you, telling you ghost stories of Salem and the witch trials. But they don't really focus too heavily on the witch trials. It's kind of stories about, you know, throughout Salem's history. Um, but it is a live show and they have live actors that go around and special effects that make it seem like it's haunted. You know, it's nothing that's going to terrify most of you or anything like that. Actually, I would recommend it if you are coming with a family. I think this is good. It's just scary enough that your children will get a little thrill of fright if they like that kind of thing, but not so scary that they would probably have terrifying nightmares or something like that. Um, so I would say check it out while you're in Salem. Uh, whether or not you have a family, but if you have a family, it's definitely something that I think everyone would probably enjoy. We also took a swing over to the town of Danvers, and there they have the Rebecca Nurse homestead. Rebecca Nurse is one of the more famous victims of the 1692 Salem Witch Trials. This was the home where she lived, and they also have a recreation of the meeting house or church. Um, Of course, it's called the meeting house because they that's what they called church was meeting, but it was used basically as like the town offices. It was also the courtroom and like everything else. So uh, they have a recreation there. So that's kind of fun to see. And the Rebecca Nurse homestead uh, is not really anything to write home about looks wise. But again, just thinking of the historical importance and knowing that, you know, within these walls, walked poor Rebecca Nurse, who was a very well-respected citizen, kind of the first person in the witch trials that was accused that made people say, uh, wait a minute, this doesn't seem right. She's been like a super awesome person her whole life, and we all love her. So why, what's what's going on here with these witch trials? Still didn't end them right away, because that was over the summer where she was executed in 1692, and the trials continued for a while. But That was kind of the first one where people took notice and started to say, something doesn't seem right here. Our tour guide, I did not catch her name, but that's probably all for the best based on what I'm about to say. Uh, She was very knowledgeable, but she definitely had some fixed ideas. And (laughs) I didn't really want to get into it with her, but she was basically defending Puritanism and, and... and, you know, people of the times and everything. And, and there's a place for that. But uh, I think it's very few of us who would choose to be a Puritan. But she seemed kind of open to the idea. So, you know, whatever. More power to you. Of course, Halloween Day is tomorrow. And you kind of already know my plans if you've been paying attention. I'm throwing a party at work. And then after that, I am going trick-or-treating with, well, in theory, it would be my niece and nephew. But... My niece, unfortunately, had some surgery on her legs, just like her poor old uncle had to have. 
uh, different kind of surgery, but and unfortunately for her, this is her third. She's got a kind of a chronic problem with her leg bones. Um, hopefully, this is the third and final surgery she's had in her lifetime on these legs, and she is recovering from that. So she's still going to wear a Halloween costume, and her friends are going to come to her, and of course, I'm sure she'll get plenty of Halloween treats. So it might just be me and uh, one of my nephews trick-or-treating this year, um, or maybe I'll stay home with my niece and hand out candy with her. Depends what the nephew wants, I guess, because uh, he might be too cool for his uncle now that he's uh, almost 11 years old. So we'll see. But th those are my plans. What about you guys? Hit me up on the social medias and let me know how your Halloween season has been. What have you done to make the season special for yourself? And how do you plan to spend the big day? Or how did you spend the big day? Probably by the time you heard this, in case you don't listen to it right away. All right, now let's move into our big discussion on Ben Cooper. Ben Cooper was born on the Lower East Side of New York in 1906. As a young man, he studied accounting before briefly attempting a career as a songwriter. When his songwriting didn't take off, he moved into the theatrical costume business in 1927. Cooper designed costumes and sets for the Cotton Club and several editions of the, Zig's, the Ziegfeld Follies. I'm not going to fix that. I stumble on things sometimes. I'm a human. That's how you know. Uh, but in the 1930s, live theater was becoming a little less popular due to the Great Depression. However, Halloween was starting to take off as a holiday. And Cooper and his brother, Nate, decided that they would take a gamble and move into the Halloween costume creating business, which was a pretty brand new business back then. Uh, if you listen to my History of Halloween episode, you'll see that the actual origins of trick-or-treating and all that kind of stuff, they're a little bit murky. There were Halloween parties, of course, before this and Halloween costumes before this, uh, but this is uh, when Ben and his brother Nate got into the business in New York in 1937, they created Ben Cooper, Inc. Now, Ben and Nate assumed control of a company that had already had the license to Disney characters, such as Donald Duck and Snow White. So this is pretty early in Disney history. But these movies were, of course, very popular. So when, when they got control of those licenses, Ben Cooper was basically put on the map at this point because they were able to sell Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Donald Duck, Snow White, Seven Dwarf costumes. And this is when they became known as a major player in the Halloween costumes for children. Now, by the way, when I say Halloween costumes for children, keep in mind, at this point in American history, Halloween was a holiday that was pretty much only for children. Yes, there had been adult parties earlier in history, but the World War... And the Great Depression had seen things become scarce, and it was kind of gauche if you were an adult and you were celebrating and being a little bit wasteful. And, you know, a lot of these supplies were rationed for a period of time. So it kind of fell out of favor as an adult holiday, and it belonged to the children. The Ben Cooper costumes were such a hit that they began to sell them at uh, large chain stores such as J.C. Penney's and Woolworth's and other five and dimes. Their costumes uh, were, at this point, made with thin plastic masks, just like they always would be. Um, these are the masks that you remember if you are, oh, probably over 30 or so, uh, that had the single elastic band that would inevitably break. And uh, later on, we are more familiar with the plastic smock style of costume, but in the early days, it was actually fabric. A very thin and flimsy fabric, but it was actual fabric that the costumes came with. Now, when we say costumes, um, it doesn't, they weren't made to look like, you know, authentic. Well, let me give you an example. I recently bought off eBay. Uh, I don't know what year it's from. It doesn't have a year listed on it. I tried to do some research. I couldn't even find a picture of this particular costume online. So I'm not sure what year it's from, but it is made of fabric, not plastic. And it is a very basic witch design. And uh, based on the color schemes and everything, I'm guessing this is a rather early Ben Cooper Halloween costume. Uh, and it does have fabric, and it has uh, this is a witch costume. 
So it's got a plastic witch face. And of course, when I took it out of the box, the elastic on the back broke immediately. Wasn't kidding about that. Uh, the one that I have is in very poor condition. The mask is, is fine, but the uh, costume itself is in rather poor condition. It's literally falling apart. It's disintegrating before my eyes. And uh, it's got fabric, but it's got this really cool pattern of like witch faces and black cats and moons and stuff all over the pa- all over the fabric. I'll put a picture up online. And uh, and then it has like this. I don't know what color they were originally, but they appear to be brown. They might have been more of a golden color back in their prime. Um, but these these little pants that come with it too. So uh, you know it's not exactly meant to look authentic, but this is a style that uh, the the Ben Cooper company would stick with. Uh, we're going to talk later on, but they, as an example, acquire the license to the Star Wars um, characters. And you get, like, say you got the Chewbacca costume. You would get the Chewbacca mask, which looked like a thin plastic mask of Chewbacca. And then the smock, you might think, would be brown with, you know, painted to look like fur with the uh, belt around and everything, but that's not what it was. It was actually like a bright yellow smock in plastic with a red lining and then like a picture of Chewbacca's face. And uh, I don't, you know, it might have even said Chewbacca or something like that. Uh, So (laughs) that, and that's kind of what all the costumes were like. Not all of them. Sometimes, sometimes they did actually try to make it look more like what the actual person would be wearing. Um, But for the most part, that's what you got. Uh, you could have Dracula. It would be Dracula's plastic face. And then on the smock itself would be a picture of Dracula. And it would say Dracula, which I imagine was very helpful for the adults opening the door. And they could say, oh, it's Dracula, instead of trying to guess what character this kid was. When they first appeared on store shelves, and for much of their run, these costumes were very, very cheap. Um, in in the early days, they would sell for $1.25 which would be about $14 in today's money. Um, so, you know, it was a little bit of an expense, but it wasn't like crazy expensive like you might see now. Costumes, I don't know about kids' costumes, but adults' costumes, generally, if you're buying a store-bought costume, you're not getting out without spending at least 50 to $60. Uh, and that's on like something kind of basic, you know. In the early years, their most popular costumes, despite their Disney license, were still the uh, old monsters. But, you know, this was a time when the Universal Monster movies were still being made in the in the 30s and 40s, so I can understand why those might be popular as well. You had Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, the Witch. All of those were the most popular. But then as they moved into the 50s, Ben Cooper very smartly started acquiring the license to different TV characters. So characters like the Lone Ranger became very popular at this time. Ben Cooper never really rested on their laurels, though, because they were always trying to innovate and come up with a new gimmick to lure in the children. Uh, For example, they came up with the Hairy Scary line, which was a line of masks that included real hair. Now, probably not real hair, but the masks had a plastic hair-like substance attached to them. Uh, And also... They listened to parents' concerns because, you know, street safety is a problem. So in the 50s, uh, the company created its Glitter Glow costumes. These were jumpsuits that would have large amounts of blue glitter glued onto the front, which would reflect off the headlights of oncoming automobiles. So easier to see in the dark. And I think I've talked about this on shows before, too. But I, even as a kid, was a big stickler for my Halloween costumes. Now, we can debate how good they were, and if you've been following my Instagram account, you've seen some of my Halloween costumes from years past. But in my own mind, I always looked amazing, pretty much. And anytime my mom was like, you need to wear a jacket because it's cold out, or you need to wear this reflective vest or something like that, I would basically shit a brick because it was not authentic to what I was doing. She was messing up my costume and all of that stuff. So it's nice that these costumes, you know, made it sound like, oh, you get to glitter and glow, but actually it was a safety measure that they were throwing in there for the parents. In the early 60s, the Ben Cooper Company had banked heavily on the popularity of President Kennedy. Sorry, I got distracted by my cat for a second there. 
uh, the popularity of President Kennedy and First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy. But of course, uh, in 1963, President Kennedy was assassinated. So the Ben Cooper Company had to destroy all of their remaining Kennedy masks. I'm really sorry. I got a little distracted there. My cat was making some funny noises. And then also, I'm very afraid that I am saying Ben Nye when I mean Ben Cooper. Ben Nye, if you don't know, is a very famous makeup company. And uh, if you're a theater person, you've almost certainly run into them and you may even have bought a Ben Nye kit. Maybe that's something worth talking about on a future episode. But if I ever say Ben Nye, just know that I mean Ben Cooper. Maybe I'll be less nervous about it now and I can go through this like a normal person. In the 60s and 70s, Ben Cooper Company continued to grow because they acquired licenses to Saturday morning television shows and other cartoons that children would enjoy and would want to dress as. They also started moving in to uh, movies and with a lot of foresight, they even acquired the license to Star Wars before it had even been released. They were taking a big chance on this, but the rights for them were a little bit easier to get than the toy rights had been. Uh, it's very famous that George Lucas insisted on owning the rights to the toys, and he struck up a deal with Kenner, and it was a, a whole process. Kenner didn't even have the toys ready in time for Christmas, and they had to send out empty boxes with a voucher for the toys. Um, but the Ben Cooper Company had the costumes ready to go uh, when the movie came out, and the reason they were able to do this was because they were the main game in town as far as Halloween costumes went. And also at this time, things weren't looked as looked at as collectibles and, you know, that these the, these were going to be thrown away on November 1st, basically. So George Lucas was much more willing to say, oh, yeah, um, I guess we can do Halloween costumes. And if we're going to do Halloween costumes, we might as well go with the biggest name in town. And that is Ben Cooper. So that is how Ben Cooper acquired the license to many things, uh, including Star Wars. Also in the late 70s. They produce a mask and costume set based on a rated R movie for the very first time, and that movie was Alien. And if you've ever seen the Ben Cooper Alien mask, it's a it's kind of funny because, you know, Ben Cooper makes very small, flimsy, thin masks, and this one, I, I, I mean, I guess we're used to seeing Alien from the side anyway, and... Well, I'll post a picture on social media, and you can judge for yourself. So by the early 80s, everything was going great for the Ben Cooper Company, number one game in town. All these amazing licenses to Hanna-Barbera, Marvel characters, Star Wars, all kinds of things that kids love. He-Man. But they did hit a little bit of a snag here. They had a very large financial loss in 1982 and 83. Because this is the time when seven people died after taking the painkiller Tylenol. Investigators discovered that someone had tampered with the product, lacing it with potassium cyanide. To this very day, the perpetrator of this crime has not been caught. Parents all over the country were terrified, and they refused to allow their children to go trick-or-treating. There were questions about the safety of the candy found in stores, and of course homemade treats were still relatively popular at this time. But now the question was, what exactly were in these treats? This started a downturn in costume sales that the company would not recover from for several years. It was kind of the beginning of the end. It's also around this time that adults began celebrating Halloween once again, and this is a market that Ben Cooper kind of missed out on. They didn't really figure in for this, as far seeing as they had been, and willing to spot trends and jump on them, they never really got into the adult market. They did make some um, finer costumes with cloth and everything like that, but uh, these costumes were much more complicated to make. They were harder to sell to stores because they took up more room and had to hang and, and all that, and people had to try them on. Um, so Ben Cooper did dabble in this stuff, but they never really made it their focus. And this could be one of the things that really ended up hurting them throughout the rest of the 80s and 90s because, like we said, adult Halloween costumes were becoming big business. 
and other companies saw this and you know they might still continue to make costumes for children but they also really looked into making costumes for adults still even uh, with the setbacks that they had suffered in the early 80s and the onslaught of the adult Halloween parties uh, in 1984 Ben Cooper company was still the largest supplier of Halloween costumes in the United States the company did finally recover around 1987, and it looked they looked to be on the right track to make a full comeback and be the dominant force in the Halloween costume industry. Unfortunately, despite this, a lot of the damage had kind of already been done. Due to their financial instability, a lot of their former licenses were pulled by the companies that owned the rights uh, and given to competitive costume companies, such as Collegeville. And uh, this really hurt Ben Cooper's sales. And just when it seemed like they were on the verge of making this big comeback, they filed for bankruptcy in 1988. It was around this time that they apparently start, started a separate toy line as well, which was a big flop. I'm not sure if the toys were ever produced or if they just sunk too much money into research and development of these toys or what happened. I couldn't find a ton of information online. But apparently they tried to start a toy line, and that ate up a lot of money in the company as well. So, here we are in big trouble in 1988. On January 6th, 1989, the company's facility in Georgia burned to the ground, destroying more than $2 million in inventory. Unfortunately, their insurance company refused to cover the loss, citing inaccuracies in the insurance application. The Ben Cooper company did take their insurance company to court to get them to pay for this, and it took a lot of work and a lot of filings and a lot of cases and a lot of appearances, but eventually they would win this case and be granted some money, but it was uh, too little too late because it took years. It wasn't until 1991 that these uh, settlements were made. And by then, the company had decided to move its headquarters to Greensboro, North Carolina. But again, unfortunately, this proved to maybe not be such a great move because they once again filed for bankruptcy, blaming the moving expenses on this and failure to secure certain grants. And with all of this, they went into bankruptcy once again. And this time, there was no getting out of it. Eventually, the company was bought by Ruby's and dismantled, and the Ben Cooper Halloween Costume Company was no more. And yet, just like some of the famous monsters that once peered out from inside the Ben Cooper costume boxes, perhaps the Ben Cooper Company would come back from the dead. In 2016, the Cooper family bought the rights back to the Ben Cooper name and all, from Rubies. They announced that they were going to be relaunching the Ben Cooper Company, and every article that you'll find online talks about this and links to their website. But this was back in 2016. Some of these reports are from 2017. I'm reading them in 2018, and when I click on the link, I see nothing. The web page is gone. They do still have a Facebook presence, but their last post was in December of 2017. So I'm not sure that Ben Cooper will be making the big comeback that some of us hope for, but I root for him, if that's any consolation to anybody. I hope that they do. It would be really cool. The thing about these Ben Cooper costumes, you know, we look back on them with nostalgia because we, who are of a certain age, grew up with them enjoyed them, remember them, even the parts that were frustrating, even the stupid elastic bands that always broke. That's part of the charm uh, of these costumes. And of course, some of the artwork was really cool. Like some of these smocks and everything with these pictures of Dracula or the Wolfman or even Chewbacca on them, you could frame those and hang those up and they'd be pretty interesting little conversation pieces. And the masks themselves, you know, some of them weren't so great, but some of them were really, you know, pieces of art and uh, worthy of framing them in their own right. But if we're talking as a Halloween costume, 
the quality of these costumes leaves a lot to be desired. So I think if it wasn't for the great art and the nostalgia factor, you know, I can understand why this company maybe didn't survive. Ben Cooper stuff has become collectible. And uh, I, like I said, I did recently purchase my first Ben Cooper adult costume. Uh, well, sorry, it's a children's costume, but I purchased it as an adult. It's the beginning of what I hope will be a little mini collection. I don't want to go crazy, but I would like to have a few nice boxed Ben Cooper costumes. So I got, you know, like I said, kind of a damaged one for my first one, but you know, it's it's still nice and it's I like that it's older. Uh, but you can find them on eBay anywhere from five to five hundred dollars, really, uh, depending on what you're going for. And just keep your eye open; you can find some good prices on things. Uh, the mask are the most collectible part, but of course, a, a true collector wants the full set in the box, uh, in an undamaged box, preferably. So, those are the ones that get crazy expensive. But if you're just looking for, a, you know, a nice Batman mask, you can get those for five to ten bucks, even if it's from the '60s or whatever. So, there's some good deals to be had out there. And that pretty much sums up the Ben Cooper story. There's one more thing that I forgot to mention as far as my Halloween season goes. And I can't believe I forgot to mention this. I talked about it a little bit on Facebook uh, and mentioned that it would be a topic on this week's episode. And that is Halloween the movie, the 2018 movie. Jamie Lee Curtis is back. And so is Nick Castle, kind of, as Michael Myers. I'm only going to touch on it very briefly because it's still relatively new and you may not have seen it yet. Although, if you're listening to the show... What's wrong with you? you? You should be a fan of this and, and want to see it opening weekend. I did. Uh, I was... I, there's going to be no spoilers. I'm going to do this without spoilers. Being kind to you guys. Um, I re, there's a lot of things I really want to say, but I'm going to hold my tongue. I will drop little hints and everything. But uh, just very briefly, um, I was really looking forward to this movie. Even though when I saw the trailer... A lot of people were like, oh my god, yes, this is badass. This is what we've been waiting for. That was not my reaction. When I saw that she was going to be like uh, a doomsday prepper, basically, Laurie Strode, um, I was kind of like, oh, all right, I guess. Um, But, you know, I was still very, very happy to see Jamie Lee Curtis coming back and very interested in seeing what that would mean. Uh, I liked that they were doing away with a lot of the sequels. I kind of liked that they were getting rid of the whole brother-sister angle, which I think was hurtful to the film overall. Uh, the film franchise, I should say. But um, I I want to see it again before I make a final judgment. But I will say that I left the theater very disappointed. Uh, I feel like it was advertised to be something different than what it was going, than what it ended up being. I thought it the hype and the marketing made it seem like this is a, a different kind of slasher movie. This is elevated. Uh, this is this is going to be a classier affair. This is going to be um, elevated, I guess is the word I would use. It's going to be an elevated version of Halloween. And I will say, I enjoyed it. You know, I think it's one of the better Halloween sequels. Um, but that's really not saying much as much as I love the original Halloween and as much as I can enjoy some of the sequels for various reasons, um, most of them having a kitsch or camp factor, uh, this one, like I said, better than some of the sequels, but, uh, a lot of, a lot of things disappointing. Let's see, how can I go through some of them without spoiling? Well, one of them is the marketing of this film is about, you know, how this is about a trauma survivor and she's coming back and she's kicking ass and she's reclaiming and she's powerful. Um, I actually really liked Jamie Lee Curtis in this movie as I like her in most things. Um, I have no problem with any of the actors in the movie, by the way, that's, that's not really one of the problems. Um, but this is not an accurate depiction of a trauma survivor. I do work in the mental health industry. I do not work specifically with people who have been traumatized, although that has come up in my career. Um, and I've, I have not ever worked with someone who has been traumatized due to, you know, uh, attempted murder via serial killer or spree killer as Michael might be more called. Um, but this 
I have watched an awful lot of true crime shows and uh, an inordinate amount, as a matter of fact. And I've studied true crime quite a bit for this show and just for, you know, interest. That's one of the things that I'm into. Um, this kind of reaction from a person who that just becomes completely mentally unstable and is always, you know, prepping for when the attacker returns uh, doesn't happen. Doesn't seem to happen. So to say that this is a reflection of trauma victims, I think, is kind of an insult to trauma victims. Most of them, uh, well, I shouldn't say most of them. I don't know what the percentage is, but the ones that you hear about on TV, uh, a lot of times they really are badasses, but in a completely different way. Not in a way that they're hunting their killer or something like that, or their attempted killer. They're badasses in that they've gotten through it, that they've gotten over it, that they're able to live a seemingly normal life despite what has happened to them. Uh, so I think the movie actually does a disservice to trauma survivors in that way. And uh, I, I don't want to I, I don't want to spoil things. So I'm just going to give some clues as to things that I take issue with. And then maybe in a month or two, we can discuss it further. Or you can reach out to me uh, through social media and we can discuss it that way. Um, the Dancing Boy podcasters the doctor uh also wait if Lori's so sure that michael's coming back and out to get her why does she stay in the town where it all happened and where he can find her just saying and that i've listened to a lot of podcasts about this maybe i missed something maybe she doesn't live in town maybe she lives far enough away but she's able to go and visit i don't know but it seems uh I don't know. I guess basically I want to have a bigger discussion about this than I'm prepared to have now because I don't want to spoil it for you. But that what I said about the the uh, the idea that this was going to be a, a loftier version of a Halloween movie. It's not. It's a uh, it's a slasher. It's it's got a lot of cheesiness to it that you would expect from a slasher. Uh, there's some things that I liked about it, too. It's not it's not. I don't mean to say that it's a bad movie i haven't made that decision yet it might be in my opinion um but i don't think so i didn't hate the movie i wasn't like sitting there like oh my god this is terrible how can they do this um but i did walk away disappointed i'm not mad at you i'm disappointed in you uh but let's talk about it so hit me up on the social medias let me know what you think about the halloween movie if you've seen it then we can talk spoiler free and uh figure out our feelings that way we'll talk about our feelings once again i want to wish you all a very happy and safe halloween i hope that you have made the most of this halloween season and i thank you for spending part of it with me and uh, you can spend even more of it with me on the social medias that I've been talking about. You can hit me up on Facebook at facebook.com slash spooky AS and you can join the Spookaroo group there. You can also uh, find me on Instagram at spooky ass shit. I'm also on Twitter, but again, don't really use that these days. Um, although in theory, if you tweet at me, I probably will see it. And you can always email me via the website but the email address is spookyassshit at gmail.com and the website is spookyas.com or spookyassshit.com. Once again, thank you so much for listening. If you could, take a moment and write a very nice review either on Apple Podcast or Stitcher or wherever else you happen to be listening to this. If they allow you to rate and review or sub and subscribe, uh, please do so. Please share the show. This is a perfect Halloween treat for you to share with your friends, so go ahead and do that. And until next time, don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs>